atmosphere won't uh, bother the participants. Thank you. All right, well, hello, one and all. And as it was uh, mentioned, this is the, this afternoon we're starting a, a special four part series on the transcendentalists, exploring the ideas of four prominent characters in that amazing philosophical movement of the early to mid 19th century. The series will begin with a consideration of Ralph Waldo Emerson and his concept of the oversoul and relating that to certain statements in Madame Lebowski's Secret Doctrine. And uh, on succeeding Saturdays of the month, we'll focus on Margaret Fuller and uh, followed next by Henry David Thoreau and finishing up with Walt Whitman. Uh, we should say this series is sponsored by the website uh, universaltheosophy.com. And it has been conducted by several associates of the United Lodge of Theosophists. Now the American Theosophist, William Q. Judge, writing about the greater theosophical movement, said that wherever thought has struggled to be free, wherever spiritual ideas as opposed to forms and dogmatism have been promulgated, there the great movement is to be discerned. And that is certainly an apt description of uh, this, this constellation of, of brilliant minds associated with the New England transcendentalists. They were the theosophists of their era. And I thought it would be useful to start us off with a brief overview of New England transcendentalism in general and what was it, uh, wh where did it, from what did it arise and, and what did they espouse. Um, and in this respect, it's difficult to define it in any sort of precise, definitive manner because there was no transcendentalist creed. There was no, uh, uh, there were no articles of faith. There was no one book uh, or prophet that they gathered around. But the philosophy of transcendentalism uh, did center around some essential concepts and um, in his lecture, The Transcendentalist, uh, which he delivered in 1842, uh, Emerson pointed out many of these, these concepts and uh, traced the term itself back to Immanuel Kant. I wanted to read just a short uh, passage from this. Um, this was a lecture that he gave. What is popularly called transcendentalism among uh, 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 what is popularly called transcendentalism among us is idealism. Idealism as it appears in 1842. As thinkers, mankind have ever divided into two sects, materialists and idealists. The first class founding on experience, the second on consciousness. The first class beginning to think from the data of the senses. The second class perceive that the senses are not final and say the senses give us representations of things, but what are the things themselves? They cannot tell. The materialists insist on facts, on history, on the force of circumstances and the animal wants of man. The idealists on the power of thought and, the will, and of will, on inspiration, on miracle, on individual culture. And further on, he says, he says this about uh, the, the term transcendental itself. He says, it is well known to most of my audience that the idealism of the present day acquired the name of transcendental from the use of that term by Immanuel Kant of Königsberg, who replied to the skeptical philosophy of Locke, which insisted that there was nothing in the intellect which was not previously in the experience of the senses, by showing that there was a very important class of ideas or imperative forms 
which did not come by experience, but through which experience was acquired. That these were intuitions of the mind itself. And he denominated them transcendental forms. The extraordinary prof profoundness, profoundness and precision of that man's thinking have given vogue to his nomenclature in Europe and America to that extent that whatever belongs to the class of intuitive thought is popularly called at the present day transcendental. And in drawing from a, uh, a book by Harold Goddard, Studies in New England Transcendentalism, uh, I put together a list of some ideas that, some key ideas that they embraced. And uh, Goddard points out that they all approach these concepts in their own way, of course, some placing more emphasis in one area than another, uh, and they were couched in their own intellectual framework. But in general, that there were these main concepts that sort of run through all of these transcendental thinkers. And these were, uh, first, the unity of the world in God and the eminence of God in the world. And the idea of the soul of each individuality of each individual, the soul of each individual as identical with the soul of the world. And the prime importance of self-reliance and individualism and the essential unity of all religions and a disregard for all external authority and for tradition. And always an underlying everything else was a fundamental belief in the, in the identity of the individual soul with God and an unshakable faith in the divine authority of the intuitions of the soul. Now, New, New England transcendentalism emerged in the 1830s in centered around Boston and Cambridge and Concord where Emerson and Thoreau had their homes. Um, and it was in, in some ways uh, kind of a pushing back against the established Unitarian church. Uh, the Unitarian, Unitarianism had arisen in the 18th century as a more liberal and less dogmatic response to Calvinism. And by the early 19th century had dominated the Harvard Divinity School. Emerson's father was a Unitarian minister and Emerson himself uh, went to Harvard Divinity School and was a member of the clergy until he resigned in 1832 over some kind of doctrinal disputes. I don't, I don't quite remember what they were. But, uh, but while the Unitarian Church was indeed less dogmatic and more liberal in its views than the stern Calvinism that it displaced, uh, by the 1820s and 1830s, it, it had in the views of, of quite a few people uh, grown conventional and stale and settled and uninspired and stuck in its ways. And th there emerged a man uh, who many consider the first of the transcendentalists. Um, and he was a Unitarian minister named Ellery, Ellery, Ellery Channing. And uh, although he never severed his connection with the church, he was keenly aware of its shortcomings. Uh, Emerson referred to him as our bishop. And he wrote this in 1820. I have before told you how much I think Unitarianism has suffered from union with a heart withering philosophy. I will now add that it has suffered also 
from a too exclusive application of its advocates to biblical criticism and theological controversy. In other words, from a too partial culture of the mind. I fear that we must look to other schools for the thoughts which will thrill us, which touch the most inward springs and disclose to us the depths of our own souls. And, uh, and, and Goddard points out that, the, that the, the typical Unitarian of this time was a man of, of tolerance, of, of intellect, of cultured tastes, and of an exceptional private morality and notable civic virtue, as well as many other admirable qualities. But he was not either metaphysical or emotionally spiritual in his temperament, philosophy, and enthusiasm he did not have. Yet philosophy and enthusiasm were exactly the things of which his religion stood most lamentably in need. I was quoting uh, Harold Goddard. And, uh, and it was indeed this lack of enthusiasm, this lack of philosophy and independent thought that Emerson so famously called out in his address to the Harvard Divinity School in 1836. And uh, it, it was an address that so offended the Orthodox administration that he was not invited back to speak for over 30 years. Now the New England Transcendentalist Movement is usually thought to have begun with the formation of what became known as the Transcendental Club in Boston, uh, started in 1836. It was an informal gathering of men and women interested in meeting together to discuss the new views in philosophy and theology and literature. And initially the group consisted of, of uh, Emerson and uh, Bronson Alcott and, uh, and a few others. And, and, and it was later joined by Margaret Fuller and, and Thoreau and Theodore Parker and Nathaniel Hawthorne and, and a great many others. And um, in 1840, uh, a transcendental magazine was started up, a, a journal called The Dial, which, with Margaret Fuller was the editor. Uh, and the journal discussed theology and philosophy and contained papers on art and music and literature and trans had translations of Oriental scriptures and, and lots and lots of poetry. And uh, its contributors uh, were Emerson and, and Fuller and Thoreau and Bronson Alcott and Ellery Channing and the Theodore Parker and quite a few others. So the, the transcendentalists did indeed look to other schools as, as Channing said. Emerson and Thoreau and Fuller and Alcott especially were deep students of Greek philosophy. They studied Plato and, and, the, and the Neoplatonists. And they gave serious attention to Eastern philosophy, to including the, the Vedas and the, the Bhagavad Gita, which had first been translated into English in the, in the last part of the, of the 18th century. And they had a familiarity with the with the classics of Greek and Rome, Greece and Rome, but that, that 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 was typical of, of, of a well-educated person in the 19th century. So we could say then that the New England transcendentalism was a time of awakening, in which the light of the ancient wisdom shone and, and found a home. I was going to uh, conclude my remarks with a, uh, a short reading from one of Madame Blavatsky's articles, uh, which she wrote in 1888, concerning uh, the, the transcendental. She said, she said, the American transcendentalists discovered that life could be made a sublime thing 
without any assistance from circumstances or outside sources. Of course, this had been discovered many times before, and Emerson only took up again the cry raised by Epictetus. But every man has to discover this fact freshly for himself. And when once he realized it, he knows that he would be a wretch if he did not endeavor to make the possibility a reality in his own life. The Stoic became sublime because he recognized his own absolute responsibility and did not try to evade it. The transcendentalist was even more because he had faith in the unknown and untried possibilities which lay within himself. The occultist fully recognizes the responsibility and claims his title by having both tried and acquired knowledge of his own possibilities. So with that, then let's take a deep dive into Ralph Waldo Emerson. All right. Thank you, Russ. Uh, Emerson opens his essay on the Oversoul by pointing to what we might call the golden moments of a human life. These golden moments give credibility to the fact that there are higher states of consciousness available to the individual. And the source of these golden moments can be attributed to the overbrooding nature of what we might call soul. Emerson's writings um, could be characterized as a collection of golden moments. And to appreciate them sufficiently, we must explore, however briefly, the manner in which he delivered them. The, the spiritual lit literature of mankind, which is the birthright and the inheritance of every human being born on this earth, is inspired literature and, and is accompanied appropriately by a certain poetic beauty. If you think of the shlokas of the Bhagavad Gita, the verses of the Dhammapada, the stanzas of Zion, the axioms of the Tao Te Ching, the logia of the Gospel according to Thomas, or the melodious passages of the Voice of the Silence, you cannot help but hear a, a distinct musical quality to the writing. Uh, if you were to read Plato in the original Greek, we're told, you would discover that his writings sound more like Shakespeare or Shelley than systematic philosophers like Hobbes or Hegel. Truly inspired writings, such as we find in sacred texts, has a cadence, a rhythm, and a melody that is unmistakable. This musical quality has a hidden, you might say even an occult power, to lift and elevate the receptive mind, the open heart. This capacity is one of the keys to appreciating the brilliance of Ralph Waldo Emerson. His intent was to inspire. His thoughts and writings are more like flashes of insight or collections of mystic moments and less a geometrical proof or a rational explanation. He is a poetic rather than a systematic philosopher. And that is why it is important not only to read Emerson, but to listen to him as well. So it just so happens we've invited him into our proceedings today. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Accept the place the divine providence has found for you, the society of your contemporaries, the connection of events. Great men have always done so and confided themselves childlike to the genius of their age, betraying their perception that the absolutely trustworthy was seated at their heart, working through their hands, predominating in all their being. And we are now men and must accept in the highest mind the same transcendent destiny, and not minors and invalids in a protected corner, not cowards fleeing before a revolution, but guides, redeemers, and benefactors, obeying the almighty effort.
and advancing on chaos and the dark. Emerson is a man of contemplation in the classical sense. He ruminated and wrestled with the great issues of human life. He brought depth and breadth to the eternal questions. For some writers, it is said that the unit of thought is the page. For others, the paragraph. For Emerson, it is the sentence. And this accounts for why he is so widely quoted. He set his radar to the frequency of a higher life. His wife would recount on how on many occasions she would witness her husband rushing out of bed early in the morning. She could not help but ask, what's the hurry? I must catch a thought, my dear. I'm going to catch a thought. Long morning walks were part of Emerson's daily routine, and he believed nature was his muse. We all know how a long walk has a meditative quality about it. The body and the senses are engaged while the, the mind is given a chance to work independently and with minimum interruption. This discipline was built into the fabric of Emerson's days. Emerson was often criticized for the disconnected nature of his prose, but his aim was not to convince or persuade, but instead to light a fire under the mind of his listeners and to encourage them to pursue their own explorations. The universal themes of these med meditations, <clears throat> like the oversoul, which is our topic for this evening, self-reliance, compensation or karma, cycles, nature, experience. These broad themes reveal the expansiveness of his thought. Emerson is, to use his own words, man thinking, capital M, capital T. And his ambition in life was to encourage this activity in others. And he did so in the latter phases of his life by offering lectures throughout the land during America's adolescence. He was considered by many as one of the finest orators of his generation. When we read Emerson, we find his spirit cheerful, amiable, optimistic, and introspective. The great naturalist John Muir met Emerson when he was a young man and said of him, he is the most sincere man I have ever met, as sincere as the Redwoods. Emerson was elegant, but not academic in his words. His intention was to make you feel the ideas as much as to understand them. This musical approach to, pro to his prose helped to create an atmosphere solicitous of intuition. His work tends to move from insight to insight, much like a symphony glides from movement to movement. There's a wonderful story about a simple, uneducated washerwoman who attended every lecture Emerson gave in Concord. Emerson's talks are very deep and rich in language and for many could be hard to understand. A local reporter attending an Emerson lecture and who had noticed her frequent attendance could not help but ask her if she understood what Emerson was talking about. She replied, not a word but I'd love to go and see him stand up there and look as though he thought every one of us was as good as he is. So from where does Emerson's love of and faith in humanity come from? He had plenty of evidence to the contrary concerning man's goodness. He, he lived at a time of great social unrest filled with severe examples of man's inhumanity to man his generation struggled with the institution of slavery, the Civil War, robber barons, and witch hunts. He experienced profound personal loss with the early death of his first wife, Lydia, who died two years after their marriage at the age of 20. His first son from his second wife, Waldo, died at the age of five from scarlet fever. So where does this abiding sense of optimism come from in the midst of such misery? The supreme critic on the errors of the past and the present, and the only prophet of that which must be, is that great nature in which we rest. 
as the earth lies in the soft arms of the atmosphere, that unity, that oversoul, within which every man's particular being is contained and made one with all other, that common heart of which all sincere conversation is the worship, to which all right action is submission, that overpowering reality which confutes our tricks and talents and constrains everyone to pass for what he is and to speak from his character and not from his tongue, and which evermore tends to pass into our thought and hand and become wisdom and virtue and power and beauty. Emerson's idea of the oversoul suggests an overbrooding, omnipresent spiritual essence that defies explanation and confounds all our ordinary states of consciousness. Being omnipresent and transcendent, it is the voidness of the seeming full. Being imminent and within, it is the fullness of the seeming void, to borrow the words of the voice of the silence. The concept of the soul and the concept of the oversoul blend in and out of each other in Emerson's essay. And well, it should, if one would be the mirror and reflection of the other. Emerson makes it clear that the soul is not an organ, but the user of organs. He tells us that the soul is not the container of knowledge, but rather knowledge itself. It is the wisdom of the wise, as Krishna says in the Gita. He says that the soul is the source of perception itself. This is precisely where our training in theosophical philosophy comes to our aid. What we discover straight away in the first fundamental principle of the secret doctrine is the idea of the absolute, the causeless cause, pointing to a notion of radical unity from which the very idea of oneness arises. Mysteriously and metaphysically, this absolute is experienced by conscious beings in manifestation as the one law, the second proposition of the secret doctrine, signifying a unitary relationship between spirit and matter. This law that pervades all of nature and the I am I consciousness that wells up within every human being are both pointers to what Emerson calls the oversoul. He is loath to, def to define it and prefers to point to it, much like a child excitedly pointing to a butterfly alighting upon a flower. In the third fundamental principle of the secret doctrine, the relationship between the oversoul and the idea of individual souls is brought to light in the secret doctrine. And this, of course, is the third fundamental principle where she writes, the fundamental identity of all souls with the universal oversoul, the latter being itself an aspect of the unknown root, and the obligatory pilgrimage of every soul, a spark of the former, a mirror of the former, through the cycle of incarnation or necessity, in accordance with the cyclic and cyclic law, excuse me, cyclic and karmic law, during the whole term. In other words, no purely buddhi divine soul can have an independent conscious existence before the spark which issued from the pure essence of the universal sixth principle or the oversoul has a passed through every elemental form of the phenomenal world of that manvantra and b acquired individuality first by natural impulse and then by self-induced and self-devised efforts checked by its karma thus ascending through all the degrees of intelligence, from the lowest to the highest manas, from mineral and plant to the holiest archangel, Dhyani Buddha. All individuals are reflections on a lower plane of this oversoul. Uh, let us not forget the original meaning of the word individual or individus, meaning not divided or whole. The individual is a sevenfold being with one's higher nature reflecting the oversoul. 
This metaphysical idea stands behind the Greek notion that man is the microcosm of the macrocosm. From this point of view, you might say, the Oversoul could be associated with the Atman in the theosophical scheme, and the individual soul, of which it is a reflection, is Buddhimanas. This curious idea that we are a self, all lowercase letters, within a self, capital S, within a self, all caps, is mentioned in both the Gita and the Voice of the Silence. Krishna says, we should raise the self by the self. Let him not suffer the self to be Lord. For self is the friend of self. And in like manner, self is its own enemy. Self is the friend of the man who is self-conquered. So self is like a foe hath enmity to him who is not self-conquered. The self of the man who is self-subdued and free from desire and anger is indeed, or excuse me, is intent on the supreme self in heat and cold and pain and pleasure, in honor and ignominy. The man who hath spiritual knowledge and discernment, who standeth upon the pinnacle and hath subdued the senses, to whom gold and stone are the same, is said to be devoted. And then in the voice of the silence, we are told, saith the great law, in order to become the knower of all self, thou hast first of self to be the knower. To reach the knowledge of that self, thou hast to give up self to non-being, being to non-being, and then thou canst repose between the wings of the great bird. I sweet as rest between the wings of that which is not born, nor dies, but is the Om throughout the eternal ages. Now Emerson mirrors these ideas in his Oversoul essay. Man is a stream whose source is hidden. Our being is descending into us from we know not whence. The most exact calculator has no prescience that somewhat incalculable may not balk the very next moment. I am constrained every moment to acknowledge a higher origin for events than the will I call mine. As with events, so it is with thoughts. When I watch that flowing river, which out of regions I see not, pours for a season its streams into me, I see that I am a pensioner, not, not a cause, but a surprised spectator of this ethereal water, that I desire and look up and put myself in the attitude of reception but from some alien energy, the visions come. And the blindness of the intellect begins when it would be something of itself. The weakness of the will begins when the individual would be something of himself. All reform aims in some one particular to let the soul have its way through us. In other words, to engage us to obey. Of this pure nature, every man is at some time sensible. Language cannot paint it with his colors. It is too subtle. It is undefinable, unmeasurable. But we know that it pervades and contains us. We know that all spiritual being is in man. A wise old proverb says, God comes to see us without bell. That is, as there is no screen or ceiling between our heads and the infinite heavens, so, there, so is there no bar or wall in the soul where man, the effect, ceases and God, the cause, begins. The walls are taken away. We lie open on one side to the deeps of spiritual nature, to the attributes of God. Justice we see and know, love, freedom, power. These natures no man ever got above, but they tower over us, and most in the moment when our interests tempt us to wound them. 
every woman and man has a direct and original connection to the Oversoul. But the degree to which it can shine without impediments on the lowest planes of existence is determined by the level of receptivity in the awakening heart and mind of the individual. In it, we live and move and have our being, yet we seem to know it not. In the words of the voice of the silence, alas, alas, that all men should possess a liar, be one with the great soul, and that possessing it, Elias should so little avail them. So there must be something blocking this connection. Something is interfering. After all, a lie is the source of one's consciousness. It is the life and energy that animates all our various vestures and vehicles. You might say the goal of human evolution is to build a trustworthy bridge between the highest planes of being within so that they might be expressed at the lower planes of becoming. To establish and maintain this connection is the real object of the spiritual path. A stubborn, confounding, deflecting, and subtle, separative sense of self is impeding the light. From within or from behind, a light shines through us upon things and makes us aware that we are nothing, but the light is all. A man is the facade of a temple wherein all wisdom and all good abide. What we commonly call man, the eating, drinking, planting, counting man, does not, as we know him, represent himself, but mystery represents himself. Him we do not respect. But the soul, whose organ he is, would he let it appear through his action, would make our knees bend. When it breathes through his intellect, it is genius. When it breathes through his will, it is virtue. When it flows through his affection, it is love. The very concept of soul in contemporary culture is a confusing one. In conventional religious circles, we get the idea of having a soul. It is considered some sort of appendage, which we can lose or gain depending on our standing with God. In psychological circles, the idea of soul is all too often reduced to some primitive collection of instincts, or at best, a nagging conscience related to emotional states. And uh, materialistic science sees consciousness as a byproduct of the brain and has no use for the idea of soul. In contrast to these perspectives, the theosophical idea of soul is woven into the fabric of the idea of consciousness itself. In the modern theosophical movement, the term self has been introduced in the attempt to resuscitate the ancient notion of soul being something that one is and not something that one has. Emerson provides uh, a useful stepping stone to help us connect to the deeper notions of soul found in the perennial philosophy. According to Emerson, the soul is related to the idea of the whole, the all. No part is left out. Everything is included. We live in succession, in division, in parts, in particles. Meantime, within man is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. And this deep power in which we exist and whose beatitude is all accessible to us is not only self-sufficing and perfect in every hour, but the act of seeing and the thing seen, the seer and the spectacle, the subject and the object are one. We see the world piece by piece as the sun, the moon, the animal, the tree, but the whole of which these are the shining parts is the soul. 
Only by the vision of that wisdom can the horoscope of the ages be read. And by falling back upon our better thoughts, by yielding to the spirit of prophecy, which is innate in every man, we can know what it saith. Every man's words who speaks from that life must sound vain to those who do not dwell in the same thought on their own part. I dare not speak for it. My words do not carry its august sense. They fall short and cold. Only itself can inspire whom it will, and behold, their speech shall be lyrical and sweet and universal as the rising of the wind. Yet I desire, even by profane words, if I may not use sacred, to indicate the heaven of this deity and to report what hints I have collected of the transcendent simplicity and energy of the highest law. What soul represents should not be given strict boundaries because it is a dynamic conception and it can stand for various levels of the unmanifest and formless realms of being. Emerson is helpful in this respect because he communicates the ideas of the Gupta Vidya, the perennial philosophy, or Theosophia, if you will, without the aid of Sanskrit or Greek terms that are foreign to many of us. He is like a wise doctor explaining a surgical procedure to a patient using layman's terms. Some of the expressions Emerson uses in the Oversoul essay, like the wide silence, universal beauty, the soul of the whole, the eternal one, are all extremely suggestive and worthy of contemplation. The soul is self-contained, since it is the mirror of the whole. And therefore, to truly know the soul means we must rise up to it. A view of it cannot be attained down in the valley, but only at the mountaintop. The soul circumscribes all things. As I have said, it contradicts all experience. In like manner, it abolishes time and space. The influence of the senses has in most men overpowered the mind to that degree that the walls of time and space have come to look real and insurmountable. And to speak with levity of these limits is in the world the sign of insanity. Yet time and space are but inverse measures of the force of the soul. The spirit sports with time, quote, can crowd eternity into an hour or stretch an hour to eternity, unquote. The soul looks steadily forwards, creating a world before her, leaving worlds behind her. She has no dates, nor rights, nor persons, nor specialties, nor men. The soul knows only the soul. The web of events is the flowing robe in which she is clothed. In The Secret Doctrine, HPB praises Emerson's conception of the oversoul and equates it with the Sanskrit notion of alaya and the Latin term anima mundi, the soul of the world. Alaya is that universal essence that pervades everything from the minutest atom to the farthest reaches of the cosmos. This impersonal essence or esoteric energy is suggested in popular culture in the Star Wars idea of the force or the ancient idea of chi brought forward in the recent film Mulan. It is everywhere and nowhere in particular. It can be tapped. It is impersonal, meaning it is allied with the concept of law itself and cannot be petitioned or cajoled. These classical ideas, th this, th this classical nature um, of the thought of Emerson uh, were radical um, in his own time. But they're really classical ideas. Uh, much to Emerson's surprise, these intuitions which he so prized and so painfully cultivated, and which were rejected as heretical from a pulpit on a Sunday morning, 
were intensely interesting when delivered from a lectern on Wednesday nights. Perhaps Emerson's buoyant spirit lyrical expression and non-threatening manner contributed to the reception. Uh, this does not mean that Emerson did not have his critics. Apparently it was not uncommon for Emerson to be taken to task by religionists in his own neighborhood. But like Socrates before him, he was adored by the youth of the towns that he visited who attended his lectures enthusiastically. They were captivated by the message of unbounded human potential, calls to self-reliance, and the democratic nature of his thought. What made Emerson the philosopher of the American spirit is the ancient universality, which is the birthright of all mankind. It is appropriate that a soul like Emerson might provide these seminal influences on a nation composed of representatives from every continent. Like Gandhi, and unlike fellow transcendentalist Thoreau, Emerson was a very difficult man to dislike. His magnanimity and kindness endeared him to many. In 1872, Emerson's home was almost totally destroyed in a fire. His wife and family escaped just in time to preserve their lives, but, the, but with a few of their possessions. Emerson's precious library was no more. And being of modest means, the family's prospects of restoring their home was in doubt. The city of Concord made a collection, crowdsourced, uh, the necessary funds to send the 69-year-old Emerson and his oldest daughter on a months-long adventure to Egypt while they secretly built the home, rebuilt the home and reconstituted the library. Such was the affection held by the people of this community for the Bard of Concord. We have a great deal more kindness than is ever spoken. Notwithstanding all the selfishness that chills like east winds the world, the whole human family is bathed with an element of love like a fine ether. How many persons we meet in houses whom we scarcely speak to, whom yet we honor and who honor us? How many we see in the street or sit with in church whom, though silently, we warmly rejoice to be with? Read the language of these wandering eye beams. The heart knoweth. I awoke this morning with devout thanksgiving for my friends the old and the new. Shall I not call God the beautiful, who daily showeth himself to me in his gifts? I chide society, I embrace solitude, and yet I am not so ungrateful as not to see the wise, the lovely, and the noble-minded, as from time to time they pass my gate. Who hears me, who understands me, becomes mine, a possession for all time. Nor is nature so poor, but she gives me this joy several times, and thus we weave social threads of our own, a new web of relations, and as many thoughts in succession substantiate themselves, we shall by and by stand in a new world of our own creation, and no longer strangers and pilgrims in a traditionary globe. My friends have come to me unsought, the great God gave them to me. By oldest right, by the divine affinity of virtue with itself, I find them, or rather not I, but the deity in me, and in them derides and cancels the thick walls of individual character, relation, age, sex, circumstance, at which he usually connives, and now makes many one. I thanks, I owe you, excellent lovers, who carry out the world for me to new and noble depths and enlarge the meaning of all my thoughts. These are new poetry of the first bard, poetry without stop, hymn, ode, and epic, poetry still flowing, Apollo and the muses chanting still. Will these two separate themselves from me again, or some of them? 
I know not, but I fear not, for my relation to them is so pure that we hold by simple affinity. And the genius of my life being thus social, the same affinity will exert its energy on whomsoever is as noble as these men and women, wherever I may be. To see and live life from the vantage point of the Oversoul is the process of individuation, the sacred process of becoming the universal man. The transition from Kamamanas domination to Buddhimanas orientation is another way to characterize the challenge or predicament of the human condition. Emerson would call this living life wholly from within or self-reliance. The key to every man is his thought. Sturdy and defined though he look, he has a helm which he obeys, which is the idea after which all his facts are classified. He can only be reformed by showing him a new idea which commands his own. The life of man is a self-evolving circle which from a ring imperceptibly small rushes on all sides outwards to new and larger circles and that without end. The extent to which this generation of circles wheel without wheel will go depends on the force or truth of the individual soul. For it is the inert effort of each thought having formed itself into a circular wave of circumstance as for instance an empire, rules of an art, a local usage, a religious rite, to heap itself on that ridge and to solidify and hem in the life. But if the soul is quick and strong, it bursts over that boundary on all sides and expands another orbit on the great deep, which also runs into a high wave with attempt again to stop and to bind. But the heart refuses to be imprisoned in its first and narrowest pulses, it already tends outward with a vast force and to immense and innumerable expansions. And we'd like to close with one last quote from Mr. Emerson when he says, I, the imperfect, adore my own perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, to both speakers. And that gives us uh, time now for about, about a half hour, about 28 minutes, um, for uh, questions and discussion. And, um, I, you know, if any of you want to get on camera and raise your hand, I will try to be scanning and uh, give you uh, attention there. I don't know if sometimes there's a digital hand function. I don't know if we have that turned on. Um, so you may not be able to do that. Um, but there has also been a few entries on the uh, chat board. Um, uh, maybe we can uh, begin with one of those. Um, there, there is a, was first a comment about uh, it's a fairly specific question about is do we find the presence of the number seven, the purpose for the number seven, uh, perhaps in the transcendentalists, uh, the questioner says something about in their dates. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what that means about dates. Um, uh, I will, but uh, leave that question there. Any, any comment upon that uh, from the speaker? I'm not familiar with any mention of sevening in the Oversoul, but I might have missed it. Maybe Keith Prisker could help us. There, I'm unmuted. I, I want to first thank all of those uh, who put this um, together for the past hour. It was extraordinarily incisive and wonderful. Uh, having been a student of Emerson since I was in high school um, and still such a great uh, admirer, uh, I am not aware of any 
discussion of sevening in Emerson. Um, this is a, uh, but I do want to comment by saying that uh, on something that Jerry, you had uh, brought up, <laughs> that in essence, uh, Emerson's genius is in his sentences. Mm. Um, and much of what we have from HBB is, um, it's, much, it's much more complex. Uh, the one thing that I think I want to add to uh, the hour program is that Emerson, Thoreau, and a number of the other New England transcendentalists uh, studied Eastern philosophy and were some of the first uh, in, um, in English and in uh, Western culture to be exposed to the Bhagavad Gita uh, and to the Upanishads, uh, where they felt fully at home. Um, and, and it is also extraordinary how many times and in various ways HPB incorporates his very words into her writings uh, with, without it, of course, it being uh, plagiarism, which is a whole another topic that we don't need to go into. So anyway, that's, that's my contribution. Yeah, you, you, you really get the, the sense that Emerson's writings were kind of setting the table for the advent of the Theosophical movement. He, he was introducing a whole group of ideas and giving form. Um, in, in again, as we were talking about earlier, um, in, in language that was accessible to people, um, ideas that were really more clearly stated using Sanskrit terms and ancient uh, Greek and, and other deeper philosophical language. But uh, in that sense, I've often felt that, it, for, at least for me, I think Emerson serves as, a, as an excellent bridge. And you, I think even historically, he's, he's setting the table for what was to come thereafter. Joe, you need to unmute. We can't hear you. There, there I was being polite. Uh, I, there's a hand being raised by Ray. Do you want to go ahead, Ray? Just, I, 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 first, I want to thank all of you who have contributed the content uh, to this presentation. At some point, someone um, quoted Emerson as saying that we were somehow um, inspired spectators. And uh, all I can say is that seemly, certainly seems really true. This has been a wonderful presentation. I think the, the measure of it, at least for me, is that um, I feel more alive after listening to it than I did when I started. <laughs> and it kind of brought that uh, breadth and depth that HPB spoke of in the voice of the silence. Uh, but one of the things that, that struck me kind of unique about this presentation is that um, I was reading another work by uh, a psychologist, uh, Eric Neumann, who was Jung's, probably one of his most prestigious um, students. And he, he, Neumann observed that Jung's contributions to psychology were those of a pioneer. And a pioneer at, uh, ruffles that is brings concrete structures that have not been seen before, their discoveries. And so there are times when he's moving to one side or another and bringing things together that create new structures for those that come later to build on and live on and cultivate. And I just from this discussion of Emerson, that struck me as a wonderful parallel to what Emerson contributed to our lives. And I, I think this presentation, that the diversity of it in terms of its content and comments like we're hearing, really add to, to doing just that, that Emerson was this pioneer who brought these central concepts. And then Blavatsky, of course, took and used or reconfigured those, but 
his contributions set the place for those to be understood and taken in. So she did not have to do some of that work of being the pioneer. She pioneered a depth and breadth that could not have been assimilated without the transcendentalists and others like them. Thank you very much for that comment. Uh, let's, uh, going back to the chat board for a moment, um, a question, um, Emerson wrote that by spirit, most people mean something invisible, but for him, spirit means that which is real. It, um, wondering if the speaker wishes to comment on that. Russ, go ahead. Russ, you're muted. You need to unmute Russ. Yeah, I would. I would. Uh, I, I would. I would agree. Uh, I, 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 I mean, something can be invisible, and it can also be real. Um, uh, so I don't see that that's necessarily a a, 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 a contradiction. Um, but yeah, the, 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 I think by spirit, he's speaking of of uh, that within us, which is um, uh, greater than our circumstances and our and and what we normally think of as ourselves in you know, our bodies and our in our in our jobs and our in our circumstances and so forth so um, and 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 yes it's it's real and and and, and it's also uh, invisible <laughs> from from the point of view of, of um, well from any point of view as I, I would think I, can, I I would add to what Russ is saying that uh, it's Take something like um, the love of a mother for her child. Uh, is there it? Is there anything more real than that? Yet it's entirely invisible, <laughs> and it's intangible. So I think w what Emerson is going for, uh, if we want to put it in metaphysical terms. Um, is this um, imminent and transcendent nature of the oversoul, of the spirit. Um, it's both. And, and we're going to have a chance to experience that idea, I think, in greater depth when we get to Walt Whitman, who was adept at seeing... And Thoreau does this too, seeing the universal and particular things. So it is interesting um, for for the transcendentalists. Uh, the, these higher this high, these higher essences are real. They're not distant. They're they're right here amongst us, within us. I I, I think that could be the best that I could offer for this particular question or comment. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, just a technical thing. We have a, a request maybe to stop the screen sharing um, at this point. Uh, maybe it's going to help somebody's screen to... to there you go. It. Thank you very much. Um, gives us a little more real estate on the screen. Um, uh, let's see. There is a question. Um, Sharice got her hand up. Oh, go ahead, Sharice. Unmute, Sharice. Okay. I just wanted to add that something I learned was I'm not Sharice with the soul. I'm a soul with Sharice. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of goes with, you know, what it was, you know, what Emerson's trying to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I'm not Sharice and, you know, it's that continuum of life. Mm -hmm. That's what I just wanted to add. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's, a, that's extremely insightful and very clever of you to put it that way. I think it's brilliant, really. Uh, it, it goes back to the idea that the personality is the persona, meaning the mask. 
So it's, it's what gets us into the play. You know, it gets us into the world. It's, it's what we can use to participate and, uh, and to be part of this grand illusion of life, you know, that Shakespeare talks about. So the way you put it is putting things in their right order. And I think that's, you know, what the challenge is, is that selfishness, self-centeredness, thinking that the whole universe and all of life is revolving around us, that's getting it backwards. Uh, and uh, yes, go ahead, uh, uh, Srinivas. Unmute, please. Sri, you need to unmute. We can't hear you yet. Sorry. That's all right. Here we go. Uh, did Madame Blavatsky acknowledge uh, uh, Emerson's contribution in her writings? The answer is yes, but I think Russ is a more qualified than I to say more on that. She certainly, she mentions him several times in The Secret Doctrine, and as, and as Jerry pointed out, um, uh, her use of the word oversoul is, is, uh, is, is, is pretty much uh, uh, borrowed from, from Emerson, because that, that concept is pretty much kind of ingrained in the, in the, in the, in the, in the philosophical mind of the times. Um, and then the only other place where she really talks about Emerson and, and the um, transcendentalists is, is that little passage I read, which was a, it's just a very short article she wrote in 1888. Um, the title of the article is 1888. Um, and and uh, uh, so I think while she didn't really make a heavy use of him in her writings, she certainly built on that foundation that he helped to, to, to lay in the, 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 in, in the philosophical mind of the, of the, of the time. Kirk, would you like to add to that? Uh, I don't, I don't really have anything to add, but I know Robert Moore had his hand up. So Robert? Was it uh, in relation to that question or another question? Well, no, it's a different question. I just wondered if, um, since uh, Thoreau and Emerson and the Transcendentalists are the American philosophers, whether they had to, were particularly important for Americans to study that their expression or their way of expressing universal ideas It was important that all students of America uh, be confronted with their writings and uh, learn them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point. In fact, uh, there's many authors who have uh, written about the uh, the period of the Transcendentalists and the, the many transformations that have happened in American culture, especially as a result of their writing. And that they, um, in some sign very significant way, took this ancient wisdom of the East, because as was mentioned, the, the, uh, some of those first translations of Sanskrit texts into English occurred in the late 1800s, and then made it to, you know, the harbors of Boston in, uh, or sorry, sorry, the late 1700s and made it to the harbors of Boston in the early 1800s, 1840s or so, and were not just read by Emerson and Thoreau and Whitman, but studied deeply and imbibed and, and incorporated into their thinking in such a way that, as Jerry pointed out, without the technical Sanskrit terms, were nonetheless conveying these, the ancient wisdom of, of the East. In a, in a new way, in, in, um, and in a way that was also, that America was ripe for. So that the, not, not just in their own, not so much even in their own generation, but the generations that followed, who uh, Emerson and Thoreau and Whitman have had such a profound effect upon in so many different ways, uh, that, that that was one of the avenues one could say in which Western culture, the, the, the wisdom of the East has, permeated, begun to further permeate uh, 
Western thought. And in fact, uh, Philip Goldberg call, calls it, you know, the Vedaization of the West. <laughs> that really was that uh, they were key uh, beginners in doing that. Because also the other, the other uh, important thing to point out is that those early translators like uh, Max Mueller and Wilkins, I believe, who was the, the, the uh, Bhagavad Gita translation, even though they were great linguistic scholars, they still looked upon ancient Eastern culture in sort of a derogatory way. That it was not, you know, it was primitive, uh, you know, based on fables, uh, kind of an inadequate understanding of nature, and that, um, uh, that, that the West needed to understand it in order to convert the East to Christianity, basically. You know, so, but, but Emerson, Thoreau, and Whitman saw it in a very different way, right? And, and revered it and absorbed it and, and saw it as consonant with their, their very highest intuitions. And so, yes, it was, it was a, you know, a means by which now over several generations, the, uh, the wisdom of the East has permeated. Laura Gray has uh, uh, commented, uh, Emerson realized that the decline of Western civilization would be the lack of faith in the supreme spirit in every man. Um, so that's, that seems uh, interesting to think about the, the declines in Western civilization and the temporary declines. Um, uh, what, would you, uh, what would you have to say about that? the lack of faith in the Supreme Spirit in every man. Are you asking uh, Laura to respond, say more about it? Uh, that, that is one suggestion. I was actually pointing to you, Jerry, but. Uh, okay, okay. Um, well, uh, before I respond to your question, Laura, uh, I think after 40 some years like Keith of kind of admiring and reading and dwelling and thinking about Emerson's thoughts. Um, I think I'm in fair territory to make this statement. I, I don't think Emerson would mind including Canada <laughs> in all of this. I think he was the, he, he was the philosopher of the Americas, not necessarily of America, this the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, um, Canada, as much as what is, you know, it, in fact, they lived in Concord for heaven's sakes. They were just stone's throw from where you live now. Mm -hmm. So, um, and look at Toronto today. It's probably the most international city on the planet. Um, so I think what Emerson and Thoreau and Whitman and these quote unquote transcendentalists, they, they were, um, they, to use one of Joe's expressions, uh, radical patriots. They were patriotic about the universality of man. And I don't think they saw themselves as Americans first. I think they saw themselves as human beings first. And then, yeah. to, and then, and, and so I think, you know, if they were listening in on our conversation, they'd say, wait a minute, what about those Canadians? We're including them too. Um, but getting back to your, your, your point, I, I think this whole notion of the oversoul could be conce could be thought of as being a rethinking of the God idea. It, you, you might say it's a more philosophical and more impersonal uh, rendition of the God idea. And the God idea has been corrupted. The, the God idea has been crystallized. It's been trivialized. And to that degree, Emerson's right. I mean, it's, it's crippled mankind, not, not just in this country and in this continent, but it, worldwide. So I think that, you know, the, the expression of the oversoul, oversoul was, was basically a, a radical restatement of the God idea. Well, you brought that out at the beginning with the, um, his disappointment in the Unitarian Church and that the form overtook the cause or the real, the invisible cause, the form became more important than the, than the spirit or the over soul mm -hmm. or the cause. Mm -hmm. And HBB is constantly warning us not to become dogmatic. 
and it is stated in a lot of the literature. So I think a few of your illustrations of the um, the myths of Milan and and uh, and Star Star Wars it kind of indicates that idea of the will and using the will and um, sometimes we get comfortable in our forms and we forget that we are in the process of becoming something more than what we are right now and um, so how do we avoid the dogmatism that can come from study? And how do we maintain the becoming? I think that comes out in a few of the other comments in the chat box as well. There's a quote from Emerson that um, might address that question where he wrote, we always wish to be settled but it is only in so far that we are unsettled that there's any hope for us. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep moving forward. Jerry, you at length in part of your presentation quoted from the third fundamental of the secret doctrine and HBB refers to that fundamental, which includes self-induced and self-devised efforts as the pivotal doctrine so you've got three fundamentals, but she talks about that third as being pivotal, self-induced and self-devised efforts. And if we don't make the efforts ourselves, life has a way of coming and kicking us in the backside to get us moving. We just have to see those uh, suggestions uh, given to us by universal law as opportunities uh, to keep moving forward. And Emerson said as much, uh, to backs up what Keith is saying, when he says the life of man is a self-evolving circle. I mean, if, if we, and this is one of the great benefits of being students of theosophy, is we're told right from the beginning that no conception of any of these universal ideas is adequate. There, there, there is always a grander scheme, a grander view, a higher elevation possible. So Emerson's got it right. You know, the life of man is a self-evolving circle, which from a ring imperceptibly small, rushes on all sides outward to new and larger circles. And that, and this is the key part, without end. Without end. There's no, there's no arrival. And that's because the, the oversoul is the one. And the one is infinite and unexpressible and uncontainable, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I suppose we guard against dogmatism by keeping that in the forefront of our minds that, yes, we need to contemplate these ideas. Yes, we need to look and investigate them. But in the end, whatever, whatever conception that we have at that particular moment is just a step in a long journey. Well, we've only got a, uh, only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, Russ, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Unmute. You're muted again. Yeah, yeah I, I just thought that the um, that, that the, 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 the the references to the third fundamental proposition was a good uh, segue into a, a question that's on the chat board, which I think is is pretty and a pretty important one. It's just what can someone say more about the difference between the way the word independent as an independent man or woman is used today and how the transcendentalists used it. Um, because I, I think, you know, today we have, and especially in, the, in our country, we have this, this concept of the, of, the, of, the, of the rugged individualist and the, and the wild west and, and uh, 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 no, I'm not gonna wear my mask and, and, <laughs> and, and, and this, this type of, 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 of sense of, of being, you know, no one's going to push me around and I'm going to be my own boss and, and, and so forth, um, which, which is quite different from the independence, the independence of thought, which the transcendentalists were using and which um, it requires, uh, it, 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 it requires the will and, and the, the um, determination and the aspiration to 
to uh, kind of take things into your own hands in terms of your own uh, responsibility and and uh, and your own efforts to to discover truth and um, and, and, and so we, we speak of the self-induced and self-devised efforts that are that are a requirement for for the the moral evolution that, that that's that that's that we self-conscious beings are, are undergoing um, and that's and that's quite different from the other kind of individualism which is more relates to kind of an assertion of the personality really and and it's, it's more of an affirmation of, of, of the uh, of one's separateness from from others, rather than than uh, than, than a recognition of, of our of our oneness. So 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 these are you know polar opposites, really. That that that's uh, what comes to my mind about that. Joe, unmute. That seems like an excellent uh, uh, point to to end on today. Uh, I, on, on behalf of everyone, I really want to thank our speakers, Russ and Jerry, for giving us um, such a thorough, uh, expansive, inspiring uh, introduction to this series, as only two people who have loved Emerson for decades can really do. And, you know, so we're not only grateful for the preparation they did for this presentation, but really for their lifelong, authentic love of Emerson and their insights into how he fits into uh, American culture, the world we live in, and of course the larger theosophical movement. Um, I think I speak for everyone when I say they uh, today they they rang a, a higher church bell than any physical tower that's been built and beyond any church that can be named. And um, it, it's certainly elevated my experience this afternoon. Um, so. Uh, this was an excellent start to this series, and uh, please join us again next week, October 10th, when the theme will be Margaret Fuller, A Conversation. And uh, if, uh, unless anyone has anything else to add, I think we'll close the meeting. Thank you, Joe. Thank jo. you all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.